Hello, and welcome to the People Grow Places podcast, where we explore the virtuous circle of people, growth, and place. Brought to you by Grow Places and hosted by our founder, Tom Larson. Right, Nick, thanks very much for joining me today. It's a real pleasure to have you here. I'll introduce you to the podcast, yep. first of all. So it's called the Grow Places podcast. We're, we are Grow Places. Our mission is to grow places that improve quality of life for all. So we are a developer, a place shaper, um, but with uh, an emphasis on trying to, you know, think about things sustainably, think about things in a holistic, inclusive and affordable way for, for people, mainly based in London, but operating across the UK. Uh, and I'm really grateful for you having this conversation. This media platform that we're creating, the theme is around exploring the virtuous circle between people, growth and place. The idea that as uh, people grow, yeah. that enables places to grow and as places grow, they can support the growth in people and you kind of get this symbiotic relationship. So maybe I'll pause there and what do you think of any of that? Uh, crikey, if only it were that simple. Exactly. Um, I, I think we uh, struggle quite a lot with the uh, metaphors that we use to describe what are often complex things. Mm -hmm. The city is machine, the city is living organism, uh, the city is a complex system. Yeah. It is possible for it to be all of those things all of the time and for none of them to be true. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think we need to think much more deeply about the dynamics of the interrelationship between the economy, big capital, mega trends, particularly climate change, and what happens on your front doorstep and the way it informs how you respond to those issues. Uh, and I think some of the mistakes of the past have been an, um, an assumption that we can walk in other shoes simply by consulting with them a few times. Uh, getting things stuck onto a big brown piece of paper and then carrying on uh, and actually we now know it's a lot harder and a lot more sophisticated than that yeah yeah no absolutely and I'm, I'm really grateful for you taking this time to have a discussion to get your perspective because you do have a, a you know not necessarily a unique perspective but a very sort of rounded perspective on some of these issues given some of the roles you, you currently occupy and also have previously so just a couple of minutes why don't you sort of tell everyone a little bit about yourself first of all uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a white middle-aged guy who's spent his life uh, ending up in charge of things and then trying to figure out quite why I agreed to do it and what to do about it. Um, uh, I still uh, quite regularly say I appear to have ended up uh, as a grown-up, but I variously worked in academia, uh, a long career in public service, uh, chief executive of two London boroughs, two very different London boroughs, Leafy Barnet. Uh, and uh, the amazing hyperdiversity of Haringey, uh, then uh, Chief Executive of uh, the Homes and Communities Agency as it transformed, evolved into uh, Homes England, uh, and then latterly uh, here as President of Averson Young, the Real Estate Advisory practice here in the UK. So uh, a bit of uh, private sector as well as a long dose of public sector and always a genuine interest in the, the dynamics of a city, uh, what makes places work, uh, and what working means for whom and when, very different in different parts of even London, uh, and a real sense of and how could an organisation make a difference in that. Mm. Uh, by the by, uh, also uh, I can rattle on quite a lot about music. Uh, I tend to have an opinion on pretty much everyone else's music taste, which is obviously not as good as mine. Uh, and a sort of a, a, an increasing concern about models of leadership, both for place and for organisations that are focused on individuals, focused on that sort of great man moment, and much more uh, interested in how one moves and shapes collective groups and is informed by them. Mm. So your experience in the public and, and private sectors then, in terms of that, that leadership, that ability to, to move people, minds, actions, um, how, how, do you, how do you see that operating in each of those spaces and your learnings from that? So one of the things I've, uh, I consciously made a decision uh, to leave uh, public service and uh, work in the private sector. Uh, I, I got to the point where if I don't do it, I never will. <clears throat> and 
Um, yes, there are differences, but uh, what's been both really, really heartening and I have to say been a bit of a wake-up call for me is that here at Avis and Young and actually in many of both of our advisory competitors and elsewhere, uh, values, why people do the job, the extent to which they respond to leadership that's about purpose and not just profit, uh, has greater read across into public sector than I uh, think is ever really shared. Uh, my reflection is we spend a lot of time talking about the differences. We don't talk about what's the same, that I've got people here in this organisation who are as passionate about the regeneration of communities and places as the people I work with in Haringey and Tottenham. And in fact, uh, uh, many of them have close networked relationships across the public-private barrier. Uh, and it is probably better to talk about where the differences are in uh, goals and objectives for different organisations than thinking everything is different uh, because actually that's just not the case. Mm. That's not to say there are things that are very, very different. I'm not sure how many social work workers become office agents uh, or vice versa. Uh, but that is not to say that uh, even amongst both of those groups there isn't a more than grudging awareness of the difference and necessary skills involved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so a bit of a message here that uh, it can be really easy to talk up difference in organisations, but the amount of common ground and the tools and ways of binding and bringing people together are actually far more similar than I'd imagined. Mm. I guess one other thing I'd reflect is uh, what changed in my uh, time in public service. That's incredibly grand, isn't it? Apologies, listener. I'm not a completely pompous tosser. Um, <clears throat> mine is the career that marked the very tail end of the high watermark of public spending and then over a decade, 15 years of varying forms of austerity. Uh, so the... Uh, public service has not been deeply financially minded, uh, concerned about the bottom line, hugely financial literate, it, literate, literacy. Um, certainly in my time in public service, obsession with the bottom line, trying to figure out where value is, means that some of the cliches about the two sectors are just not true anymore. Uh, it's really, really common that uh, you will see uh, most public servants obsessing about the numbers, having no choice but to, in much the same way as a private organisation would can be concerned about profitability uh, and how to price something. So uh, I think we're a little at times trapped in cliches about the sectors uh, and as much that they could both learn from each other and much they've got in common. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really encouraging, isn't it, for, for where we are now. And um, <coughs> so how, how do you think time factors into to that? In, t in terms of time horizons, because everything we do in the built environment, you know, you're a minimum of a five-year time horizon. You're often talking about much longer. And does does that? Do you feel <coughs> that the, any of that kind of factors in when you when you think about your role in the private sector as well as the public? <coughs> Look, um, uh, it would be a much neater and tidier world, wouldn't it, if everything worked to the sorts of time horizons one needs to deliver large projects. Uh, deliver significant shift in things like modes of transport, uh, change perceptions of places. They are necessarily long haul and strategic projects. Uh, they butt up against election cycles, life, uh, but they also butt up against PE investment cycles. They butt up against investment uh, criteria shifting as interest rates move. Uh, so there are a series of short-term rhythms and staccato events that inevitably affect uh, longer-term strategies. They're pretty crap strategies if they can't withstand the actual real world. And I, at times, take a pretty dim view of pleas for, you know, well, politicians are getting in the way, or, you know, the elected members are, the pro are a problem. Uh, no, they are part of the solution. And it's about ensuring that the bedrock for any strategy uh, and understanding of the benefits are widely understood and shared, even if there is disagreement around the edges of those things. And I think uh, much of what we face in uh, many cities is that those, those issues have become so hotly contested that the sense that there can be a longer term strategy is a little lost when actually to talk about current news, 
Should we have people living in tents on streets? Uh, no, but that they are requires a longer term strategy than not having tents on streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a lifestyle choice. Uh, but the point I'm making is it can be very easy to get drawn into, you know, whether it be uh, election cycles or actually if you're in the public sector, what on earth is going on at times as uh, funding, investment, ownership shifts in private sector uh, organisations and schemes. Uh, what we need strategies uh, that can actually withstand uh, those issues because that's the real world that we rightly live in. Uh, and I think uh, the search for some of those is about uh, both a better quantification of the benefits in the longer term and I have to say more confidence in delivery than we've been able to show latterly. We, we seem to find it very hard to follow through. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so Nick, take, take me back a little bit to you personally, you know, growing up as a lad in the north, like what, what shaped you as a person? Why do you feel like you've ended up doing the things you've done? Um, and, and has led, led to you being in the sort of position you're in and, and how, how does that feel for you, that sort of position you've ended up in? Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm from the north, so I'm not great at this bit. Um, I, I grew up in Huddersfield. Uh, Huddersfield is a, a beautiful northern town, northern mill town, a once wealthy town that has been in a series of cycles of decline and probably looking back comprehensive education uh, in a town that was clearly going backwards not forwards and that's not to speak ill of a place that actually I'm you know incredibly fond of and I had a, a pretty happy childhood there but it, it did have an impact on me and also this sense which was very very real that the action was everywhere other than Huddersfield. So if I'm frank, getting away to university at 18, I couldn't wait to leave. I wanted to be, I went to Liverpool. I wanted to be in Liverpool or Manchester or Leeds. I wanted to be where the action was, particularly culturally. Uh, but I also wanted to be where I had a sense that there was more opportunity. I didn't ever envisage from the moment I got on that uh, journey to university that I would be going back to spend the rest of my life in Huddersfield. I wanted to be in a city uh, and I wanted to be part of something bigger and that definitely shaped my experience. And then look, I'm dead lucky. <clears throat> I was 18 in 1987, which means I lived through that peak period where the Northwest and Manchester in particular, uh, something was happening, you know, uh, musically, uh, nightclubs, but also more widely in regeneration and creativity in the rebirth of a different sort of municipal pride. You know, the, the brilliance of Manchester City Council in the 90s, I lived through much of that, uh, experienced that, and that had a huge influence on me in terms of what you can do, shaping a place, shaping a city, and the dynamic relationships uh, that can come as part of that. So uh, I kind of joke quite regularly, I went to the opening night of uh, Bar Bar, which was, of course, Urban Splash's first genuine commercial project of any scale. And I've known Tom Bloxham for so long now that we're in danger of being the Stadler and Waldorf of real estate events. <laughs> uh, yeah, the sort of uh, James Murphy losing our edge. We lost our edge so long ago, we can barely remember where it was. Um, <laughs> uh, but. It definitely, looking back, had a huge impact on me in, in, in two ways. Living in a place that there's a sense of urgency around. I came to London in the late 90s and stayed here through that. And, you know, it's easy to forget that I had relatives in London and we would visit in the 70s. London felt like a place that was in decline. And to come here and see this sort of pacey growth and this urgency. So Manchester and London had a huge impact, as did this sense that uh, public service, the ability to invest could make a real difference. And I, I began my career, I was a lecturer at the University of Liverpool and I was really interested in sort of public management, uh, how the state could work and intervene, interested in technology and its role in that. Uh, so those things have really shaped me. Uh, and then I really, I, I just, can't bear 
things being done carelessly and thoughtlessly. And in organisations, it, it sort of slowly drove me insane, so I felt I needed to do something about it. That's kind of, that's where it comes from. Uh, and I guess like lots of people, lots of people in the sector, lots of people who are involved in real estate, uh, they're kind of curious, you know, kind of polymath curious about what makes that thing work and why. Uh, and so working in local government, these kind of mad hydra headed organisations and then being drawn more and more to thinking about the place and its economy, uh, it, 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 it just helps satisfy that, that curiosity. Mm. Why doesn't it work? How might it work? What could be different? And it's that that really kind of keeps me, if not jumping out of bed because I'm old now and I'm kind of grumbly. Some of my friends would say I was young and grumbly as well. But it's those things that uh, have really shaped me. And, and along the way, uh, yeah, I've had the privilege to work with some really, really, really brilliant uh, leaders as colleagues, as bosses. Uh, and those people, those people are really, really important to me. And I, I, I say to anyone I uh, mentor, younger and newer colleagues at work, you know, don't just think what job you would like, think about the leadership you would like to work for. What's going to benefit you next? Uh, because that's the way to have a really rewarding career and also to sort of continually challenge yourself. And uh, I'd quite like to see more cities do a bit of that. You know, who do you admire? Well, why aren't we going and finding out what they're doing? You don't have to copy it, but just be inspired by that stuff. So, you know, I work with them. Um, with a really brilliant man in Lewisham, I was actually working in the environment services department, parks, street sweeping. Uh, but the uh, my boss there, a man called Donald Stavert, a sort of wily Scotsman. Uh, uh, I learned so much about how to understand other people's perspectives, uh, deal with everyone from the leader of the council to the part-time street sweeper you know, struggling to make ends meet, and that sort of leadership lived with me. <clears throat> really uh, great political leaders, Mike Freer in Barnet on the, you know, Conservative Party, and then Claire Cober in Haringey, people with real vision and drive, you know, as a public servant, that's what I was interested in. So uh, uh, finding leadership that helps shape you, helps you kind of reflect and grow has been really important for me and being part of a conscious choice of some of the jobs I've taken. Mm -hmm. Think, if you think it's about you personally, it's, it's a stupid thing, isn't it? It's what can you learn from others? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, <clears throat> and thank you for sharing all that, Nick. That's really, really good to just listen to and observe. And, and I feel like I know a lot more, you know, about you as a person just from from listening to that. And you know, just for openness, you know. So I'm from I'm from Norwich. That's where I'm from. I kind of had a similar kind of. Uh, yeah feeling in that sense of you know a place that that was was great to grow up in a great childhood you know both my parents worked in the nhs i uh, went to state school as well and but i always had this sort of like desire to kind of to to explore to go and do something something different so that brought me down to to london and i like norwich norwich is i think one of those places in the country that uh, is already a really great little city yeah but why it isn't one of the best and most livable places in europe is just a question of how do you open up some of the tremendous development opportunities there? How do you improve connectivity between not just the capital, but the wider southeast and Norwich? Mm -hmm. And how do you make use of the incredible educational assets in the wider economy? It's just got so many great ingredients that it just feels like uh, if uh, the leadership of the city council and the partners continue to stir the pot, uh, that things will happen there and things could happen there. Uh, uh, and so they should. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I've um, got a hotel at Carrow Road where you, if you go late at night, you open the curtains in the morning, you're looking out on the pitch, which yeah, is yeah. a slightly weird experience. I was there yesterday, actually. So yeah, exactly that. <laughs> they sold that off uh, many moons ago when they needed some uh, yeah. some money. That's niche and, knowledge. Uh, yeah, it also, exactly. also demonstrates the sort of value point I spent much of my careers in hotels. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Nick, can we can we spend a little minute on housing? Yeah, of course. Because um, again, you know, 
well, you know, just by virtue of my age, demographic, you know, housing has always been something that's at the forefront of Tom's my making mind. A, I'm a young person plea here. Exactly. <laughs> so, look, look, my, the first thing to say on my take here is that whilst the problems in the housing marketplace in the UK are manifold uh, and touch everything from design and sustainability uh, through affordability into the relationship between people's long-term financial health and their asset base. Um, sometimes complex problems have simple and straightforward solutions. Uh, I'm uh, always minded, uh, there's a bit of footage of uh, 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 Manchester United, sorry, this is a football. Uh, no, I'll, I'll use another analogy because it's easier. There's a really great bit in the uh, uh, a book about Bob Dylan where they're talking about uh, creating like a Rolling Stone. And at the time it was at, right at the boundary of what could be done technically to record, you know, an eight or whatever it is, nine minute song in one take, multiple instruments, uh, very little tracking available. So uh, he gets in members of what's essentially part of the wrecking crew to play. And they have half a dozen takes and they're, they're just not very good. And eventually uh, Dylan stops and says, look, everybody, could you just play? Stop hitting the drum and just play. And I think the version of that for the housing market is we don't build enough homes, full stop. Therefore, we need to build more homes. And if we, as a sector, as a country, as a population, simply accepted that fundamental truth and then began to solve all of the other problems, we'd be in a very different situation. Building more homes, it's a good thing. And the point where it ceases to be a good thing is so far away that we need not worry about it. Uh, and actually, if you begin to build more homes, we can then begin to address many other problems uh, as part of that. But in a period of hyper-scarcity, all that happens is any individual intervention simply is like squeezing a pretty angry balloon, the problem pops out elsewhere. Uh, so absolutely, building more home, homes should include everything from the creative reuse of every building that's available and could be used. It should be maximising the opportunities in the rented sector and professionalising rent. It should be about incentivising uh, homeowners to think about how they use their own assets. It should be about incentivising the finance sector to think about new solutions for converting assets into other and alternative investments. But all of those things need to be underpinned by the need to build more homes uh, and that those homes need to come at a range of price points and a range of subsidies. So, you know, I am a strong advocate for new settlements, for densification, uh, for the use of any transport infrastructure uh, to generate more homes, and particularly for seeing uh, the vast array of towns and cities across the UK as being potential residential development areas, all of the above. Uh, because a uh, nation that's building is a nation that's generating wealth. It's a nation that's generating opportunities. Uh, and it's a nation that then begins to address some of the other issues. Uh, and that means, I think, uh, government and investors taking some new risks. We don't have enough people building homes. And the obsession, and this may surprise some people, I am unconcerned about the big four or five house builders, you know. Um, don't shoot them for making lots of money and building homes. It's what they're supposed to do, they're a private company. Uh, we should be more concerned about why there isn't more competition and how do we foster that? Because that's what we do in other sectors. Uh, how do we create supply chains that are more diverse? How do we encourage young entrepreneurs uh, to think about being developers? And actually, if we think in that way, there are lots of creative solutions open to investors, to banks, to others, and to government to create environments where that might happen. And I actually think that some of the big house builders might respond themselves to that challenge with their own creativity, their own idea. They're not sort of moribund, monolithic, moronic organisations. All these are smart and capable people. Uh, so I'm in favour of thinking about 
how we create a much more diverse uh, housing market. It means that not everything will work, but if you're building more, that's okay because you can afford to make some mistakes. But this scarcity issue, lack of housing, is forcing us into a series of solutions uh, that probably won't help us in the short term. Let's just begin as a country by saying we need to build more. What are the things we need to do it? And let's focus our energy on those. That's kind of where I'm at. I know it sounds really simple, but sometimes direct, mission-driven, purpose-driven is what we need. Uh, and I suspect if we do that, other things will very quickly come to the fore. Sustainable homes. You know, it's, it's much easier to regulate if you've got a diverse market with creativity because, you know, you're going to find lots of different solutions to the same problems. And I think it will also shake up the affordable housing sector. You know, we're just in a sort of a really strange moment uh, where the solutions are the known solutions and nothing else. And that's just not the case. Mm. It, it's why, despite, you know, some of the backward steps latterly, I'm totally with Mark Farmer and the uh, need to modernise the way we approach houses. It's not to say bricks and mortar, traditional build doesn't have its place, but there have to be better engineered solutions to deliver at scale the sorts of homes that we need. And, uh, you know, my, um, my trip to Japan to see the factories uh, was a genuine epiphany for me. I kind of knew, but, you know, in that sort of real visceral sense, unless you've been seen wandered round, understood, you don't really understand. And it, it, it was a real eye-opener about what could be achieved and what could be achieved at pace and scale. Mm. There oh, you thank, go. Thanks, Sorry, that's quite no, a no, rambling no, no, answer. Uh, no, but I was just listening and going, yeah, well, I kind of you know, agree with all of that. And as you say, like I said at the top, you know, it's kind of, you said to me, it's quite easy to say these things and they sound quite good. But like, so, so why, why is this... Do you feel that this is happening? Why is it not happening? For, as, from my perspective, obviously not being as informed, I, I don't feel like we're at that position that you're uh, describing. Um, so, so what I would say is that there is probably greater consensus amongst politicians about the need to tackle this problem head on than the sort of nimbiest headlines belie. And that it... My, my genuine sense is that this is a moment where if the problem is named in that way uh, and you know Gavin Bowell not to be partisan in any way Gavin Bowell had a pretty good go at it actually that white paper fixing the broken housing market it's a damn good read mm. I don't agree with all of it but it's pretty hard not to agree with the thrust of that uh, actually there are echoes of it in Keir Starmer's announcement uh, at the Labour Party conference. So I think there probably is a consensus that needs just turning into an urgent need. And uh, uh, perhaps part of the key to this is to just recouple <coughs> more effectively uh, house building rather than home ownership into economic success. Mm -hmm. It will grow the, the economy if we build more homes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being able to tell that na that narrative much more convincingly. Uh, I also think just a generational thing is happening. Um, both as older people begin to think about what on earth they do with their asset, and as the numbers in home ownership fall and housing becomes a real challenge, you know, politics ultimately goes where the votes are. And I have a real sense that that moment is probably all already with us, but other things have trumped it, but will be with us in the next decade. Yeah. So, so let's just click a switch and all what you've just said has kind of happened. We've got this yeah. consensus. Yeah. We've got um, that kind of top down aspect is solved. Yeah. From a more of a kind of, you know, a bottom up kind of approach. Yeah. To, to, what what can actually happen to respond to that more favourable environment? What would yeah. Yeah. what would be the sorts of things that you would think uh, about there in terms uh, of? So the easy stuff. There's a coalition of willing landowners and others who want to get on and build. Let's just do that. Uh, there's uh, bunches of land in public and private ownership at scale, uh, where with more patient capital, uh, some management of risk, infrastructure. We could be building and building for decades. Um, but I also think now is the moment for us to think really hard about the role and purpose of uh, town and city centres. 
as they morph and change around us and as asset owners begin to think about what next Mm -hmm. uh, well let's take advantage of that moment I mean who would have thought we're sat here I mean in the city bit of the city we're next to Guildhall and suddenly there were residential developments and popping up uh, a different version of cities morph and adapt well uh, let's do a bit of conscious thinking about that what does that actually mean for amenity what do we need to do uh, to make these livable places because there's an appetite to do it and let's go where the appetite is and let's make that happen uh, and then I feel you know in many places that better public transport better connectivity you know Huddersfield is almost exactly halfway between uh, Manchester and Leeds. Manchester and Leeds will be powerhouses of the northern economy for the foreseeable future. Who would not want to live in a great Victorian town if it were well connected to both with trains every 15 minutes? Actually other things begin to follow really easily and whether it be Tom at a Urban Splash or Tim at Kaplan Centric, the, the template for how to then generate great communities and great places is already well known. Uh, so, so I think some of this is about ambition, some of this is about underpinning infrastructure, and some of it is about reconceiving of places. You know, so uh, not every town is going to be a, you know, a centre of industry. But the idea of the dormitory is also dead now, isn't it? That's the other thing that's happened. So the sort of CBD that's just offices, that looks like it's disappearing from the rear view mirror. But quid pro quo, town centres with flex workspace, with uh, third spaces, with restaurants, with places for your kids, with creches, with nurseries, with the about well that that's the quid pro quo of CBDs dying. That's coming as well, and there's an opportunity to create livable places for lots of destinations around the country. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and that's a really, really optimistic and thought-provoking way to think about the future. And I think a lot of that, as you say, actually, it, it's just a matter of time actually before some of that stuff kind of comes through. Okay, so we've got a closing tradition on this podcast yeah. where a previous guest write down a question yeah. without knowing who it's going to be asked to. Yeah. Uh, and then it's not you, my mother, is it? It's not, it's not your mother, I don't think. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, let me go to this one. So, okay. So, if you could do one thing differently in your career, what would that be? Whoa, that is, that is a corkingly difficult question. Let me have a, uh, let me have a reflect on that. I've had a long, long career now. Um, gosh. Stupefied silence, just give me a, give me a minute. Yeah, um, you know, when I was in, uh, when I was in Harringay, um, We did a huge amount that was really important for uh, changing a council that was in real difficulty. Um, and I, I was really fortunate to have alongside me a leadership team that was just, just, just brilliant to work with. Everybody went on to be chief executives, lead bigger organisations. It was, it was, you know, it's not easy work in a place that's been through some very difficult things. Um, and we, we, we were really confident and we worked at pace and, uh, you know, a political leadership facing into some really, really difficult decisions. Uh, when I look back, when we were operating at pace, and when we were really kind of up to speed and kind of members were with us, 
I really wish that we'd explained more of that narrative more clearly, more of the time. It can be very easy, once you make some progress, to not kind of explain what the next step is and what the next step is. Uh, and and uh, it wasn't that it derailed anything, but we would have probably achieved even more had we done that. Um, that's a rubbish answer. Let me reflect on that. I don't that think that's more. a rubbish answer at all. Um, it, uh, look, the, I, I suppose the other thing I would say uh, in response to that is... Um, Look, working in Whitehall is an extraordinary experience. Uh, it was a completely alien world to me. Uh, and I, I really, really enjoyed the sort of leadership task. As you can tell, I like, I like working with people, I like working with teams. Um, I think there are times when I look back and I think, yeah, had I had more experience, the room was more, more with me than I realised. Mm. You know? Uh, uh, um, and m m maybe we might have got further. Um, but I'm not, I'm not a regretful person. I think uh, that implies some sort of version of yourself that I'm just, you know, I just I feel uh, kind of incredibly proud on a day-to-day -day basis that... I get to do this job. I, I, I'm sort of slightly. There's something quite weird about um, uh, being in an organisation um, where you realise that some people are nervous when they meet you, and I still find that I, you know, I have to get over myself a bit. And that's not me being, you know, no, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I can't drive a car. I'm fairly rubbish at most sports. Uh, I'd be much happier working in a record store. Um, so, uh, but I, at times I have thought, yeah, uh, maybe if I'd have worked hard at reading the room rather than just kind of being a bit d dazed and confused by it, I might have got further. Hmm. I hope you don't mind me saying this, Nick, but I get the feeling from you that that maybe like the crown doesn't sit very comfortably in that sense or you'd rather there wasn't a crown at all in that sense you feel like it's much more this but the reality is you know you are you know at the top of the pyramid in terms of the roles that you're you're yeah, taking on do you feel like do you feel there's an element of that for you i think that's i think that's being unnecessarily sort of tiny violin about it because uh, you don't have to be in charge do you you can do you can do something else i i do regularly uh think about the absurdity of organisations where being in charge carries all sorts of trappings with it. Yeah, somebody brings you a glass of water, those sorts of things. Because uh, it, it's just not true. And uh, I think a lot about um, time I spent working in councils, uh, uh, time working, you know, with people who do actual, really hard, difficult jobs. And uh, it's not to create some kind of fake humility about myself, um, but actually that's real and difficult work. And some of this seniority stuff is sometimes, it's a bit unnecessary and gets in the way of actually getting the work done. And some of that goes back to, I guess, in the theme of this, um, too much placemaking seen as being giving people answers. Uh, rather than recognising some of what's already in heaven. Uh, some of it is also the inverse, you know. You speak to some communities, they don't want to live in the place they're in because they've just ended up in a... You know, and we've also got to be brave enough to admit that as well mm -hmm. and not patronise people by saying, but look at all of these really great things. No, I just, you know, don't like it here. <laughs> it's not safe. You know, all of those yeah. kind of basic fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I try regularly just to kind of have that kind of talk to myself. Um, but look, I go to MIPIM. I, I quite like, you know, a decent, I'm not, I'm not hiding from any of that. Uh, they're a necessary and important part of what we do. Uh, uh, but I don't think the point's to be in charge. The point's to be in charge to do something. Otherwise, 
you shouldn't be doing it. And that, that's what I feel really, really, really strongly about. Uh, and kind of why this is, you know, a great job. We're, we're working in Manchester after, you know, all this time of my deep association with the city. We're going to start working on the, uh, a major project in the city and I could not be happy with the thought of wandering around the streets again, scratching my head with a bit of a notebook, tipping in and out of local businesses and shops, having conversations, because that's, that's actual fun to me, you know. Sorry, I'm rattling on, I work in Belfast. I'm doing some work in Belfast. Uh, Avison Young is doing some work in Belfast and I've been involved in it. And what a privilege, what a privilege for somebody to think that you might actually be able to help a place uh, and to spend time there and to get to know people and find out more and understand the opportunity. That's fantastic, isn't it? Somebody, I mean, th that somebody pays me to do that is pretty absurd, really, isn't it? You know, as I said, aside from, I don't know, working in a record store and being paid to do it, this is probably about as good as it gets, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, Nick. And um, I, look, I, I'm really grateful for you giving your time for this conversation. I'm really uh, grateful I've learned for a lot. Very fancy equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. All the gear. No idea. Were but... you formerly an architect? Yeah. Architects always have fancy equipment. <laughs> exactly. Hi. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, no. But really, really grateful for it, Nick. And um, thanks again for your time. No, no problem. I uh, hope, hope that was helpful. I enjoyed the conversation. Good. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the People Grow Places podcast. For more information, visit growplaces.com. And follow us at We Grow Places across all social channels. See you next time.